Hello, my name is Dr. Ramon Lopez. I'm a professor of physics at the University of Texas at Arlington, and my area of research, my primary area is space science. And I'm going to speak with you about coronal mass ejections. So the story with uh, CMEs begins with the sun and sunspots. And sunspots are evidence of solar magnetism. And here we're seeing white light images of the sun, a movie uh, from 2006. And there wasn't a lot going on, but you do see there a couple of sunspots. And the actual number of sunspots goes up and down over time. And this has been known for quite a while that there's something called the solar cycle. Uh, with roughly an 11 year period. And here you see the sunspot number in the uh, uh, last few hundred years. Now, at the beginning of the graph, those are actually just reconstructions. Um, observations of sunspots actually in historical annals go back to uh, the Chinese astrologers uh, more than 2000 years ago. But it was Galileo in the West who first observed and wrote down information about sunspots. He saw them through his telescope. And uh, that period from 1650 or so to 1700, where there were almost no sunspots, is actually real. It's called the Maunder Minimum. And people would write things like, you know, Galileo said he saw these spots on the sun, and I've been looking, and I can't find any of them. And there's other reasons to believe solar magnetic activity was very, very low. And such maunder type minima happen at other stars, sun-like stars, stars that got the roughly the same mass and luminosity as the sun. So there, there's still a lot about the solar cycle we don't understand. Um, but there are certain things that, that we do uh, think we, we understand. And one of the things that causes the solar magnetic field to vary is that the sun doesn't rotate as a rigid body. The equator rotates faster than the polar regions. And since the magnetic field is tied to the electrically conducting gas, the plasma of the sun, the sun is so hot that the gas is um, electrically conducting, the electrons have been stripped from the atoms. So when the plasma flows, it drags the magnetic field with it. And this differential rotation causes the magnetic field to twist up. Now that twisting is storing of energy. Just like when you twist up a magnet, uh, a, um, a rubber band, you're imparting stored energy into those twists. And that's happening in the solar magnetic field as well. And if you look below the surface of the uh, sun, what you will see is what we believe is there are that these twisted up bundles of magnetic field form tubes where the magnetic field is larger than the surrounding region and the magnetic field has a pressure and it pushes the plasma out. So although there might be pressure balance, uh, those tubes have less plasma so they're buoyant and they can float up and pop through the surface as you see on the right and the two spots where they come through the surface, well, that's those are the sunspots. And they're a little bit darker because there's a bit less plasma and they're a little bit cooler. And so they appear dark in comparison to the brighter solar surface surrounding them. So the magnetic field is critical for solar dynamics. Here on the right-hand side, you see from the trace satellite, a solar eruption. Um, of the twisted magnetic field. So that twist in the magnetic field represents stored energy like in a twisted rubber band and it can be suddenly released as we see here on the left hand side another NASA spacecraft uh, movie and you see the solar magnetic field erupting and material being flung out from the sun. In fact the the solar magnetic field is always transmitting this mechanical energy from the boiling and twisting uh, 
of the gases in the sun to the solar atmosphere and releasing it um, through processes in the, that atmosphere that heat the atmosphere to a million degrees. That's the corona. And the surface of the sun is at, is at about 6,000 degrees. That's the black body temperature. And so the heating of the corona is not due to transfer of heat in the normal way you think about it. Um, you don't heat something to a million degrees by putting it in contact with something that's only 6,000 degrees. It's other non-thermal mechanisms and the magnetic field plays an essential part of that. And in fact, the corona is so hot that the sun's gravity can't hold it down and the sun's atmosphere accelerates and expands out into space forming what we call the solar wind. Now that's always happening. There's always solar wind blowing from the sun. But then there are these other eruptions, like the ones you just saw in the movies, some of which are associated with coronal mass ejections. Now, what allows the twisted magnetic energy to be released is a process called magnetic reconnection, which is a really fundamental process in plasmas. The Normally, the magnetic field will be tied to the, the plasma because it's very high electrical conductance, free ions and electrons. Uh, normally, you know, the, the plasma and the magnetic field move together. But as we see, as the twisting of the magnetic field gets more and more intense as the plasma is circulating around in the sun, that energy has got to be released somehow. And the way that it is released is through this process of magnetic reconnection which is currently being studied by NASA's Magnetosphere uh, multi-scale mission. And uh, the thing about reconnection is that it works on a very, very small scale. That, that pink box that's labeled electron physics dominates, that can be very small, uh, you know, kilometers or even hundreds of meters in size compared to these enormous systems in space. So it, it has been a mystery for a long time of exactly what's the physics that is at work in magnetic reconnection. But now with missions like MMS, we are understanding it much, much better. And this process happens everywhere in space. So the way that solar flares release their energy and the way that coronal mass ejections then are released from the sun, that has to do with magnetic reconnection as well. So the standard flare model has got reconnection happening in this X region up here, releasing energy and uh, accelerating electrons to very high energies, which then cause the emission of X-rays from those high energy electrons. And that's what you see here on earth is the, the X-rays in the flare. And we char characterize flares by the strength of their X-rays in a couple of different wavelengths. But higher up uh, in the solar atmosphere, there might be one of these big filaments of denser, colder material that's trapped. And if the magnetic reconnection allows that to disconnect from uh, the sun, then that entire thing can lift off and produce a coronal mass ejection, as you see here on the right. And these magnetic clouds, these coronal mass ejections can actually be linked back to the sun and they have a very large scale magnetic field within them. And they are filling large portions of interplanetary space when they take off. And when one of them hits the earth, that's when you can have a geomagnetic storm. And here we see uh, pictures of uh, from, from the SOHO spacecraft from one of the coronagraph instruments, we see this dense region, which is this uh, filament of material that is up above the flare. The flare is down here, this very bright region and um, magnetic reconnection is going on there, but it's also allowing this upper region, this filament to sort of break free and uh, be flung out into space to form a coronal mass ejection. So here uh, are movies from the SOHO spacecraft, a different uh, instrument to the, uh, one of the coronagraphs on, on that instrument or on the spacecraft. Now the spacecraft uh, 
I'm going to stop the movie here to explain a bit. The spacecraft itself is at the L1 Lagrangian point. That's about a million miles away from Earth upstream along the line between the sun and the Earth. It's at that point that Earth and sun's gravity essentially balance. But to be more precise, it's the location of the gravitational potential minimum between the Earth and the sun. And if you put something uh, in that region, it will orbit around that, that potential minimum and stay there. And so we put spacecraft there in what are called halo orbits, or just little orbiting around that, that uh, part of the uh, gravitational field and looking at the sun along their sun line, more or less. So this is just a regular white light telescope. In fact, the CCD camera on, on it is far, far inferior to even the cheapest cell phone camera today because this was built many years ago. And there's a metal disc in the center of the telescope that you can see here that blocks out the sun, creating this artificial eclipse. And the white circle in the center is the actual uh, angular size of the sun in this image. And the disc is at about uh, roughly three and a half solar radii. And then it's held in place with this arm here. And what you see is the, the white light, the scattered light in the uh, outer atmosphere, the corona of the sun, including these coronal mass ejections. And let me start this movie over again. You see all kinds of other things in, in these movies, such as this planet here. Um, I suspect that that's Venus. And you see these clouds just blowing off from the sun. These are CMEs that are lifting off. And sometimes in association with those, you see this kind of thing, this, um, this streaky material in the detector like right there. Now, remember you've got a camera that's looking at the sun, which is eight light minutes away. It takes light eight minutes to travel from the sun to the earth. So what you see at the sun happened eight minutes ago. But these streaks of light in the detector are actually high energy particles at the satellite that are hitting the satellite's detector. And those particles, primarily protons, are called solar energetic protons. They are accelerated in the shock waves of coronal mass ejections. Now, CMEs aren't the only thing that can produce a shock wave in interplanetary space, but they can and often do. Not always, it depends on how fast they're traveling and what the background solar wind looks like. But in this case, there was clearly a, C a uh, shock wave and those shock waves can accelerate protons in interplanetary space up to many hundreds of millions, million electron volts, many ME, hundreds of MeV. So those protons become uh, essentially relativistic. They're not traveling at light speed, but the rest mass of a proton is roughly a GeV per C squared. So 200 MeV, that's on the order of 20% of the rest mass in kinetic energy. So at that point, you really do need to start thinking in terms of special relativity for the kinematics. And those particles, they may or may not hit Earth because when they're out in interplanetary space, they're, they're being accelerated actually relatively close to the sun uh, by these, these shock waves when they form. And then they have to follow the magnetic field and then that, that takes them out into the outer heliosphere. So um, knowing when you're gonna get a blast of these solar energetic particles, uh, from any given event is um, a tricky kind of calculation to do because you have to understand what was the background solar wind that these particles would be traveling through. So to summarize, CMEs are really an important part of solar variability that cause space weather. They can occur at any point in the solar cycle. They're more probable near solar max. They're related to flares, but not the same, but the energy that drives both flares and CMEs comes from the solar magnetic field. Now they typically have speeds of 480 kilometers per second. They can be much faster or, or a bit slower and a mass of on the order of 10 to the 12th kilograms if you look at the whole thing. So a CME will take anywhere between a day and several days to travel from the sun to the earth. 
but when the CME hits the Earth's magnetic field, it can cause a magnetic storm, depending on the magnetic field inside the CME. And that's a whole different story of, of uh, why certain magnetic field orientations will create magnetic storms and others won't. And it's connected back to the whole issue of magnetic reconnection, actually. But these CMEs, as they travel through interplanetary space, they, they interact with the background solar wind and they can produce shock waves. They can produce high energy particles, which are another important part of space weather because those high energy particles can be dangerous for astronauts and for uh, electronic systems on spacecraft, particularly those that are outside of the protection of Earth's magnetic field in interplanetary space. <laughs>